Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio. In this video, I combine a few things I've done before with several things I've been too afraid to try in the past. And not like weird or illegal things, it's mostly just types of woodwork, but I think it ends up pretty cool. When I had this slab organizer fabricated a couple years ago, I thought approximately one step ahead, meaning I thought, how do I store the most slabs? Never really considered, how do I efficiently remove those slabs from the racks when I want to use them? Is there any chance this doesn't just tip over? I feel like there's a good chance it tips over. I didn't think I'd get here. I don't know. Uh, let's regroup. The piece of wood that I'm attempting to remove from the world's least accessible slab rack is a pretty good sized chunk of white oak. And you can see I have bigger pieces of walnut there, but I was just about to tell you all how freaking heavy this oak is and that it is probably twice the weight as one of those walnut slabs that's the same size. But decided I should actually fact check myself for once and apparently white oak is approximately 25% heavier than walnut, not 100% heavier, but either way, it will make a great table so long as you never actually want to move it. Now, someone who's not a woodworker, who's never shopped big raw slabs like this, might look at this piece of wood and just not really get it. And that's okay because they may look at this and say, there's a big low spot with a black streak in it, there's cracks everywhere, it just kind of looks like a piece of wood and I don't really see the value there. Whereas a professional woodworker, someone who has shopped hundreds and hundreds of slabs can see that low spot, can see all the cracks, and they can be certain that this has no value. Because yes, this was a free slab of wood. I got this from my wood supplier, Gobi Walnut. It's all busted up. It's got terrible low spots on both sides and literally had no value to them. So they gave it to me. But a free slab is kind of like that free puppy saying where it doesn't end up being free in the end. So. Throughout this video, I'm gonna have a running total of all the expenses into this slab, starting with that first trip to creative woodworking. I'm gonna be cutting this down to its final dimensions in a couple of stages, because right now I'm basically just ripping off the live edge, keeping it as wide as I can with a nice straight edge. And you might be wondering why I didn't do this before I took it in to get surfaced, and that slab was just too wavy, too wonky to get a nice clean cut on it. So right now, just giving myself the maximum amount of buffer room because I'm about to light this thing on fire and things get a little sporty when I do that. I've made a few of these burnt wood tables and what I've found is the most interesting part actually isn't the char and it's not the solid wood, it's that gradient. It's where the burn meets the wood. And so this is how I'm able to control it. The first table I built, I just burned the whole thing and it warped terribly and was really a pretty difficult project. So what I'm doing here is I'm just kind of manually hollowing out and enlarging that natural void there that I think was actually caused by a burn. And I'm doing this with my angle grinder because this is going to be a waterfall table. So what I want is I want that burn to actually come up the leg, up the side, and then turn around the top just a little bit. And using my angle grinder, is hopefully gonna enable me to completely control that process and exactly where it's burned and still look really natural. Originally my idea was just to have the one big burn patch that kind of comes up and turns that corner on the top, but as I got looking at it, it just didn't look quite natural and looked a little bit kind of unbalanced. So I added that streak there kind of lengthwise that's gonna sit on top of the table. And I'm also gonna burn the cracks. Originally, I wasn't gonna char those, but I think it's gonna really help bring everything together. As I was building this table, I realized that it's been quite a while since I've done a viewer giveaway, unless you count that fundraiser we did for Make-A-Wish a couple months back, which I don't, because if I know my audience, they would greatly prefer the chance for themselves to win some cool tools or materials versus some sick kid they've never met that just gets to have a fun afternoon. And that's okay, these are my people. And I don't know that this is the biggest giveaway we've ever done, but it's pretty freaking big. We are giving away a couple of the Wagner moisture meters, which are like $550 a piece. And if you've seen some of my past videos where I've had disasters with trapped moisture in wood, you know why I like the Wagner moisture meter. And never mind the fact that I'm pouring water all over the slab now though. And we're also giving away things like the Blacktail Studio marking knife, the N3 nano kits, and a ton of epoxy from Total Boat, which is the epoxy I've been using lately. And it's completely free to enter. It's not like you have to buy a t-shirt to get an entry pass. Everything is free. And if you want some more information on that, there's a link in the video description. 
After soaking that slab down, I let it set for about a week before moving on to this process, which is the penetrating epoxy and probably the most important part of the whole burned wood and epoxy tables because you really need to seal up those burned sections or they will get a ton of bubbles. So I spent a little bit of time with this penetrating epoxy and just sealed the whole slab while I was at it. A couple of months ago, I had some contractors out at the house and one of them recognized me and he was really nice. He's like, hey man, you do fantastic work. I love what you do. And I was like, wow, you know, I really appreciate that. That means a lot to me. And I was out there caulking something the next day, kind of near where they were working. And he looked at my caulking job and he goes, well, you sure as shit aren't going to make a video on caulking anything. And I couldn't help but laugh because yes, look at that. I'm terrible. Despite having caulked linear miles of it, I still have no idea what I'm doing. I got these suction cup lifters probably about a year ago and I don't use them a ton, but when I do use them, I really need them because this form, for instance, was built just, I don't know, maybe a half inch bigger than the slab. So I had to just slide it in there and they made the perfect handle for lowering it down. So used it for about a half a second, but was a pretty valuable half second. Along with sealing that burn section with a really thin penetrating style epoxy, the next important step when it comes to building one of these tables is you want to use like a deep pour, really slow curing epoxy for this portion because no matter how well you seal it up, you're still going to get bubbles that kind of escape over the next 24 to 48 hours and it's just inevitable. So what I do is I use this deep pour even though it's only like a half inch thick and then I come back the next day. This is still a little bit thin. And you can see how much air has escaped. And if I had used a thinner epoxy, all those bubbles would be trapped under the surface. So I come back, pop them with a torch. And there was one section though, where it was kind of an ever going, ongoing stream of bubbles right there. And those ones are actually gonna be in there forever. So I didn't seal that section quite well enough. I waited about three weeks before coming back and attempting to pop this out of the mold. And this one actually was coming apart really nicely. I always recommend using mold release. No matter what anybody says, use mold release. It will make your life so much easier. And if you're wondering about more tips like that or why I wait three weeks to remove these from the mold, I have a free blog on my website where I go through basically every single step of building an epoxy table. I have other resources available on my website if you're interested in that too. I'll leave links to everything in the video description. And if you're wondering what exactly I'm going for here, if you haven't quite figured it out, I basically have those lower kind of carved out areas that I've charred and then I covered everything with epoxy. So right now what I'm hoping happens is I remove just enough epoxy and wood and only leave those kind of epoxy charred sections. And we'll see how that turns out though. We can add another $150 to the running total of this quote free slab. Creative Woodworking, I think, charges $75 per half hour for just wood, but if it's wood and epoxy, it's $150. So add that $150 to the running total, and here's what we're at so far. In my last video, I made kind of a denim Damascus table where I had a bunch of layers of denim and I kind of formed them into a Damascus pattern ran them through the planer, and then when I got them back at this stage, everything was kind of fuzzy again, and there were parts of this burnt section that were a little bit similar, where that charred bit just wasn't quite fully infused with epoxy. So what I'm doing here is getting just some regular kind of marine epoxy and just brushing it on just to kind of re-infuse that section. And again, I still don't really know what happens, but there's some way or something that's going on with that epoxy that doesn't fully infuse the denim or doesn't fully infuse that charred section so just coming back, topping it off, and making sure that it's just as hard as the rest of the table. The next problem I'm going to attempt to address is one of those problems where my think about it logic almost won out, and I really wanted to believe. You look at it and you go, yeah, it's nice and smooth, it's filled with epoxy, and think about it. No one will ever notice that, and if you look at it, it actually looks... Well, it actually looks really terrible. So think about it logic lost here, and I'm actually gonna fix this the right way. And I guess the right way would probably be with a CNC, but it's not that I'm too good for a CNC or too much of a craftsman. It's that one, I don't have one, and two, I don't have room for one, and three, I wouldn't know how to use one if I did have it. So here's what I've come up with. What I did was I made that really simple jig, which was essentially just cutting three straight lines. Then I came back, reset my depth, 
And now I'm just literally gonna hog this out one strip at a time, and this was fairly taxing. I don't know, it didn't take me all day, but it probably took me 20 minutes or so, so just made one pass after another. It is nice having a router like this that you can remove that whole half inch in one fell swoop, but got there, and now I just need to clean up the edges. My friend and fellow woodworking YouTuber, Jonathan Katz Moses, said that he'd come out with a new router plane and asked if he could send it to me. And I replied, one, what's a router plane? And two, when can I have it? And apparently he forgot to add the motor on this router because this is what he sent me, which is apparently like the push mower equivalent of a router. At least that's what I thought at first. But it sat on my wall for a couple of months, but eventually I had this little bit of cleanup to do on the edge here. And as it turns out, a router plane actually serves a purpose even though it doesn't have a motor. In my last video, I was describing assembling IKEA furniture the best and only way I know how, which is with very strong language. And unfortunately, that strong language offended quite a few people in the comments who really let me know about it. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I am just going to poke fun at them, minimize what they're saying without actually listening to what they're trying to tell me. But that could not be further from the truth. One commenter in particular left me a really nice and well-articulated question. He said, Hey man, this is your channel. You can make whatever type of content you'd like. However, I do like to watch your videos with my five-year-old daughter and would just like to know if this language might be popping up going forward. And I thought that was an extremely fair question and really well-written. So I did a little bit of research and I found out on this channel, I've made 124 videos for a total of about 41 hours or so of watch time. And over the course of those 41 hours, I did a little more research and I found out I've said seven swear words, which equals about one swear word every 5.9 hours or so, so clearly not G-rated content. However, a PG-13 movie is allowed one F word every two hours and a bunch more swear words, so mine is much less than that. So I'd say going forward, no, it's probably not safe for your average five-year-old, but it is not nearly as bad as that PG-13 filth. Now I'm going to cut this down to its final dimensions in preparation for the waterfall edge cut. And if you don't know what a waterfall edge is, it's basically where this table is going to turn 90 degrees towards the ground, but the grain is going to look like it's continuing like a waterfall. And I've always been notoriously bad at making these waterfall joints, so I am very stressed out now because this is by far the biggest one I've ever attempted. All right, so I don't know how you're gonna shoot this, but I'm gonna physically crawl up here to make the cut because I'm not long enough to reach over and we have to have, the, have that clamp down. Have you double checked all the measurements, all the angles, everything's good I've, to go? I've, I've, I've whatever, the hep hepta checked everything. I think we're good, but I am still like that much nervous. That's, that's a lot. So cutting depth at 45 is two and an eighth inches. This is two and an eighth, but that doesn't include the track. Oh. And I'd like to pretend that I didn't know that, but I did. I thought that it, um, I, I held it down there and it looked like it was deep enough. I recently built a timber frame style staircase for my shop and I really struggled through a lot of the construction, at least in part, because I didn't have a lot of the right tools for the job. So to avoid that in the future, I just got a handful of new tools from Shelter Institute. They're kind of a high end timber framing company. And the problem is I haven't had a project to use them on yet. And I think Scott could tell that I was a little over anxious to work one of them into a project. Are you just looking for an excuse to use the big new saw? How dare you? only ever use the right tool for the job. <laughs> oh, there you go. How bad is it gonna look? It's a little rough. Sorry, I'm gonna cut that off anyway. Yeah.
If you pay really close attention, you might be wondering why I'm using this smaller Festool saw to make this 45 degree cut versus the larger Maffel saw that I was using earlier in the video, which would be capable of making this all in one pass. And maybe it's just the one saw I have, or maybe it's that I don't know how to use it, but my Maffel timber framing saw just has pretty terrible accuracy compared to the Festool anyway. It's pretty decent. I mean, it's better than probably the average craftsman saw, but it is just not capable of getting a perfect 45 degree joint, which also, I wasn't so capable at the start of this build either because there was a lot of fitting that went on and it really didn't go as planned. All right, it's been about two or three hours struggling to get this miter perfect. And I went to the store, got some better squares, got this all clamped on there just to make sure we had that absolutely flawless fit. And finally, it looks like complete shit. And I don't know what to do now. We really have been working on this for like three hours. I don't know if you know how hard it is to make a miter that only touches in two spots, but we did it. I ended up having to call my friend John Malecki, who's another guy here on YouTube who's made a ton of these waterfall tables, and he gave me a few really simple but absolutely invaluable tips. He said, first off, you need to go just past that 45 degrees. Don't try to stop right at it on the indicator. Then he said that I shouldn't have made that 45 degree cut all in one pass. I should have cut 90 and then come back and cut the 45. So it took a few more cuts, but we got it dialed in and it is pretty freaking perfect now. It is pretty safe to say that I could not do this without a domino, or at least I could not make this look good without a domino. I'd probably use my framing nailer or something and that might compromise the look a little bit, but luckily for me, I do have the domino and you can see it does go on pretty snug. These dominoes are in there very, very tight. So I had to break out the old mallet and block of wood, but I was extraordinarily pleased with how this was fitting together now because when it wasn't fitting earlier, you could see my desperation and just how discouraged I was. But right now I feel very confident. I still don't feel like I'm quite qualified to teach people how to build these waterfall joints, but I can give you a few tips that helped me along the way. And first tip is use that painter's tape there that will save you a ton of work trying to remove that glue or epoxy from that joint. And second is get everything together. Think through the entire glue up, which I never do, but for once I did this time. So you can see I have my long pipe clamps laid out underneath the piece in advance. I have all my dominoes organized. I have that kind of 45 degree clamping piece already glued on. Everything is where it needs to be for the first time in the history of my waterfall joints. And we did the test fit to make sure that 90 degrees will fit. And there's still a lot of pressure when this is happening because you're kind of on a ticking clock with that epoxy. You have about five minutes. And right now, everything is actually looking pretty good. Anything else you wanna to do to it? I think we should just leave it alone. There's an expression in sales that says, sometimes you need to take yes for an answer. And that also applies to woodworking. So instead of continuing to fidget with it, I took yes for an answer, it looked perfect, so I just left it alone. While that joint is curing, I can get started building the other leg for this desk. And I went through quite a few different design ideas, eventually landed on something that I really like. And Scott, my video guy, made a 3D rendering and he agreed it looked really cool. However, what I don't realize at this point is Scott has no faith in my engineering because what comes out later is he thinks it's going to completely collapse and not support this table. And I might be being a little dramatic, but anyway, a little bit more on that later. But right now I am ignorantly blissful that Scott actually respects my engineering skills. While that glue on the leg is curing, I got started sanding on this piece. And this is going to be a job because I've never attempted to finish a piece like this before. Because what I'm doing is I'm going to be sanding and polishing all of the burnt epoxy sections to just a high mirror grand piano shine while leaving all of the wood extremely matte. And I've never done that before. I think it's going to be an absolutely terrible process. But at this point, I have no idea how terrible it's gonna be. So I'm just getting it roughed up, removing all of that glue on there, all the extra adhesive, making sure that my joint looks good. And it actually does look really good. So big thanks to Malecki for helping me dial in that joint. The design I'm going for here is actually a pretty similar look to the design I use on my personal dining table. Only that one was made out of 3 8 inch thick plate steel. There was two legs and a stretcher that connected the both of them. This is just gonna be one wood free floating leg, which 
Again, it's probably where Scott's uncertainty comes from and why he's filming this right now without telling me about his concerns. And again, I don't know that yet though, so I'm just getting them nice and flat because what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna end up gluing both of these together at about a five degree angle, which I think will leave a really interesting look. I'm normally not a big fan of these digital angle gauges. I don't find them to be very accurate. I think even from the factory, they say they're only good to within like 0.2 of a degree. But for what I'm doing here, it won't matter whatsoever because I needed it to be about five and a half degrees. And honestly, it wouldn't matter if it was off by a whole like two degrees, which it won't be anywhere near that inaccurate. So as long as I'm within a degree or so, it's perfectly fine, which it is. Woodworkers and non-woodworkers alike are always debating about the quality of furniture and oh, what did we do before we had these new fancy domino tools? And the furniture back in the day was way better than it is today. And had someone tell me that they worked in a museum and there was furniture there from the 1600s that is still in perfect shape, which proved that craftsmanship back in the day was much better than it is today. And I had to explain to him what a self-selecting sample size was because Yes, any furniture that has lasted 500 years was obviously built very, very well. It doesn't mean that everything that was built in the 1600s was built well. I'm sure there was garbage back then, just like there's garbage today. What modern tools and chemicals and adhesives have done for us is enabled mediocre woodworkers like myself to make furniture that will probably last at least 100 years. It's, I think, a pretty good thing. One of my favorite advertisements of all time is an old magazine ad that says, if your Harvey Prober chair wobbles, straighten your floor. And I love that because there's a little bit of hubris, but also a lot of confidence to just say, we build nice stuff, probably better than your house. And this desk will also be straighter than your floor. However, if there is a little bit of wobble in your floor. I'm adding these leg levelers. They're able to be recessed so they can be completely hidden or straighten out any of those bumps. Scott was downstairs editing and he came back right here and he's like, oh wow, you added a lot to this. Did you get some good footage of it? And I was like, I did not get any footage of this. Should I have? Anyway, Scott was, I think, a little disappointed because he wanted to show how I built those gussets to go off that angle. But those gussets are to help a little bit of that side to side, to side stability. And these are just some pretty simple little mounting tabs. I was going to use metal, but I thought that the oak would work just as well and look pretty clean. If you are a new woodworker or even an old one that doesn't use router bushings, I highly recommend working them into your rotation. I'm using them here with just a piece of MDF to get kind of a loose fit for my table base, but you can use these router bushings to get perfect inlay fit. I think Matt Cremona's got a good video on it. I think Wood Whisperer has some videos on it. There is so much you can do and a router bushing set might cost you like 25 bucks and they don't just make them for the really expensive routers. You can get a bushing set for the cheapest routers out there. If there is one tool that I continue to misuse and infuriate a small cross section of my audience, it is using this Brad Point drill bit here to mark my spots for my threaded inserts instead of using a transfer punch. And for the life of me, I really can't figure out what is wrong with using a Brad Point drill bit. I think it comes from the metalworking guys where if you use that on metal, it would break the drill bit, which makes sense, but it just seems to keep working. So I'm probably gonna keep doing it. I don't know what it was about this project in particular that involved so many other woodworking YouTubers, but I was talking to yet another one that I haven't mentioned yet about the design of this table base and the stability of it. And he ended up being completely wrong and I don't want to embarrass him, so I won't mention his name, but his channel is called Four Eyes Furniture. Anyway, I asked him about adding these gussets to it, saying I really thought that would increase the stability. And he's like, probably not gonna hurt it, but I don't think it'll really do anything for you since it's way up at the top. And he's really good at designing furniture. So I was really starting to second guess myself. And apparently Scott shared a similar sentiment. Dirty uh, space you ever made? Pretty close. You still don't trust it? I'm cautious. For those watching, if we put this in the video, Scott told me off camera, like, ah, oh, I wouldn't want to sit on this desk. <laughs> And I've never been more confident in anything in my life. So we might have to do some sort of sketchy weight competition on the end of this desk. You can, you can speak freely just now. It feels more sturdy than I thought it would, but. So you were wrong. I was wrong. <laughs> I'm actually, still not standing on top of this. I'm all stand. All right, competition. I think it looks really cool. Holy shit. Come 
wiggling. Keep one kick, guys. Keep rolling. Okay. No camera trickery here. Wiggle it. Can we give it a wiggle? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's pretty solid. Good job. <laughs> that's the most solid desk I've ever built. How, like, I, one I, scale of one to ten, how wrong were you? I was completely wrong. Are you convinced now? Yes. Are you just saying that? No, it's so much more solid than I thought it would be. Now that we have confirmed that the construction of this desk is good enough for some hipster working at a museum in 500 years to condescendingly explain to an uninterested party that nobody builds furniture like the YouTube woodworkers of the 2020s, I'm going to attempt to do the same quality of work on the finish. I mentioned earlier that I'm going to attempt to polish the epoxy while leaving the wood completely matte, and while I've never tried this before, I've seen it done a handful of times, and there's a few companies in Europe that I've seen on social media that seem to do this with success, and sometimes it looks fantastic, but other times they show it from an unflattering light, and you can see it doesn't really look that good. But there is someone here in the States, and he's in Hawaii, which is barely a state, but his name is Modern Habitats Hawaii, and he does a fantastic job. He shows it from all the lights, and it always looks amazing. So I reached out to him quite a while ago, but he basically gave me his entire process. So what I'm doing here is I'm basically sanding this from 120 all the way up to 3000 grit. And I'm not trying to sand the wood, but I'm also not really avoiding it. So he told me it's okay to get the wood wet for the wet sanding portion, because we're going to come back and we're going to fix that part later. Some of those European companies look like they're putting polishing compound right on the wood. They have like an automotive buffer, and they're just grinding it right into the epoxy with the wood right there. And I have no idea how they do that, and that doesn't compromise the wood. The Modern Habitats Hawaii, he told me the 3M compound that I'm using will stain the wood. So if I'm going to do that, I need to tape off all around it. He did say the Meguiar's compound, which I've never used and don't have, doesn't affect the wood as much. So maybe on my next one, I could try that. Or if you've done this and you know a compound that you can put straight onto the wood, I would love to know about it because this tape off process was quite the job. What I found pretty quick is this burnt gradient epoxy offered a few more challenges than the normal tables like I saw done from Modern Habitats Hawaii because there isn't a specific start and end of the epoxy. There's kind of a little bit of a gradient there. And when I taped off that first time, I tried to go right up to the epoxy line and it just left this really jagged, unnatural looking line. So I'm going to go about this another way. I made a little wider tape with that pinstriping tape, came back, repolished everything, and then I'm going to try to fix it later with sandpaper. You can see that section there doesn't quite look perfect. I think the polish looks really nice, but feathering in that edge is going to take a lot of work by hand, and I think I can do it. And before I can get to that, though, I'm going to have a ton of taping off. And some people love this. I am not one of those people. I am much more Jeremy Clarkson than James May, if you get the reference. But sometimes we have to do things we don't want to do. I personally would rather drop a big log on a table like I got to do a couple of years ago than do this. However, when we're building custom furniture, sometimes we have to do things we don't want to do. And so basically just set up some time lapses and went to town taping this off. And each section probably took me at least an hour, if not longer. I firmly believe that everybody needs somebody in their life that challenges them because you don't do yourself any favors if you just surround yourself with a bunch of yes men that confirm everything you're thinking and saying. And I don't mean this just for people in creative spaces, but probably especially people in creative spaces, because I have so many bad ideas that you guys don't have to watch come to fruition because I have people in my life that challenge me. I have friends, I have colleagues, I have wives, I have wife. I have one wife who challenges me and helps me decide if an idea is good or not. And I really believe this is what happens with athletes that come out and say the world is flat because they have lost people that challenge them. Everybody around them is too afraid to say, Hey man, you're an idiot. The world isn't flat. And luckily for me, I have Scott and Scott kind of passively challenges me, which is what happened here. So even though he's recording this right now, Scott doesn't know what I'm going to talk about. And that is that he has a bigger impact than he realizes on these projects because I got the first little bit of this done and I thought it looked okay. And I could just tell that Scott was disappointed and he didn't say anything. And finally I was like, you don't like it. And he looked down really close. And he's like, 
It's not perfect. And he was just disappointed. And he wasn't like dis disappointed in me. He was disappointed in the project. And I was like, I've been thinking about it for about a day. So as Scott's been down there editing, I built this. A pencil, with a tiny piece of sandpaper on it. And let me show you what I'm doing. What I realized is with my little power sander, I couldn't get up into these fine contours around the pencil and there was really no way around it other than to sit here and sand ever so finely with the pencil. And it's slow, slow going, but it actually works in the end and it allows me to get that really precision sanding all around this and hopefully Scott will be impressed. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking there's no way the ends would justify the means and you're not really gonna go through every little nook and cranny with a pencil and a tiny piece of sandpaper. That would take forever. And it actually, it actually is so much worse than you think because each piece of sandpaper only lasted me about two or three inches. So every couple inches, had to cut a new piece of sandpaper and continue going through every little nook and cranny. And yes, I actually did hit every single bit. Since my little pencil sander only got me maybe a quarter to a half inch away from the polished epoxy, I needed something a little more gentle than my orbital sander. My orbital sander tends to kind of wobble around and it would have killed me if it wobbled right into the polished epoxy. So used this little oscillating sander with a soft pad and that gave me a ton of control to get right up to that pencil line. From there, I hit the rest of the top and the bottom as well as the sides with 180 grit on my regular orbital sander. So everything you see that's oak looking, is gonna be sanded with 180. Everything that's black will be polished. Now I'm ready for the finish process, which isn't gonna be as bad as the sanding, but it's also gonna take quite a while. The oil that I'm using is kind of a matte to satin, so I don't want to get any of this on the polished epoxy. If I get a tiny bit, I can wipe it off with a little bit of alcohol on a microfiber, but for the most part, I want to keep it off there as much as possible. So what I'm doing, using a little paintbrush going through, getting it right up to the edge, and I cut a bunch of these microfiber towels. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wipe away, and so as long as I'm pulling away, I won't drag any of that kind of matte to satin oil on the epoxy, and it should be okay. In my last video, I built a white oak table base and I used a finish I'd never used before and it looked absolutely fantastic. It was called Invisible Oil and it basically makes it look like this oak has no finish whatsoever on it. It's just a really clean, light look. And I did try a few samples of it on a tester, kind of a test burn piece that I had. And the thing with Invisible Oil is it's not really invisible. It has a bunch of white pigments in it, which makes oak look like there's nothing on it. However, those white pigments just got embedded in that black char and it looked terrible. So if you're wondering why I didn't use the invisible oil, because it didn't look very good. I always forget about this part and it is way too late in the video to have any impact whatsoever, but I'll do it anyway. And that is to say, if you have made it 33 and a half minutes into this video and you're enjoying it, I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button. It does mean a lot to my page. And if you're already subscribed and you wanna support my channel, you would probably be shocked at how much of an impact you sharing this video has on my channel. So if you wanted to share it to Facebook or Instagram, or maybe you're a billboard executive and you wanna roll out a series of blacktail billboards on the 405 in LA, that would be fantastic. The finish I'm using is called an LED oil, and people always get mad at me when I say that, but that's actually the product name. It's called Vesting LED Oil. That's what's on the label. But yes, it's not cured from any LED. It's cured from UVs, which you can also use the sun. Generally, it takes two coats, but I was hoping I could get away with one right here. Are you happy with it? how it looks? I think it looks pretty good. The sheen, the yeah. glare, I think it's cool. The problem is, you can't see it on camera. Doesn't feel good. And more than anything, I don't want to redo all of that paintbrushing that we just did. Yeah, that's fair. I also have to sand it, and so I risk scratching it. But like here especially, it's kind of like a water pop feel. Okay. Which isn't unusual. I just hope for some reason this, this would be different. But I think I gotta repeat everything we just did. Ooh, okay. 
when I was in high school, my friend's uncle had this really nice shop and he was cool enough to let all of us work on our crappy cars there. And occasionally we'd watch him work on his really nice cars. And one day he's getting ready to start his new engine. He'd put a new engine in his Camaro and something wasn't right. And he just casually said, oh, guess we got to pull the engine out. And I remember being blown away by how well he took that because he didn't yell, he didn't scream, he didn't cuss. It's just part of the process. And so when it comes to things like this, when I had to do a whole another second code and it took me another couple hours, it's just part of the process. Even though it's not natural, even though I want to be upset, I try to be more like him. All right, now that I am finally almost done, here is the grand total cost for all the materials, consumables, and even man hours that went into this, quote, free slab of wood. However, people are always second guessing my bookkeeping, people in the comments, the IRS. So here is the grand total of absolutely everything that went into this, quote, free slab of wood. When people ask me what I do now, I generally just say I'm a woodworking YouTuber and leave it at that, but I still consider myself a furniture maker first and foremost, which means everything that leaves my shop needs to be able to be used in the real world. And to use a car metaphor, there's no trailer queens that leave my shop. And actually, is that term offensive now? I All that car talk got me thinking about it. Anyway, let me know if I need to edit that part out. But to ensure this desk is able to be used in the real world, I'm adding N3 Nano. N3 Nano is a two-part kit. This is the hard coat, which I'll put two coats of on, and then I'll put two coats of the top coat. And if you get the Wood Pro kit, which is what I was opening there, has everything you need. There's a prep spray that'll ensure the surface is perfectly clean with no contaminants. There's even a maintenance spray you could give to your clients or give to your wife to help maintain it. And if you want some more information on the N3 Wood Pro kit, there's a link in the description below. All right, this piece is for sale right now. There's a link in the description if you want to check that out. And you can see that char is hard to see from some lights and easy to see in other lights. And on the front, it's not hard to see, but it is very hard to video. Both of these miters ended up fantastic. Again, big thanks to John Malecki for helping me dial that in. And also found a nail on either side, or maybe it's just one long nail that goes all the way through. I can't be certain, but... Either way, I'd love to know what you think of this project. If you want to see me try more charred projects, more of these kind of hybrid polished and matte pieces, this has been extremely fun. And every week I like to give a little credit to people who make it all the way to the end of the video. So this week, start your question or comment with just a thumbs up or a thumbs down to let me know what you think. As always, thank you so much. Have a great week. I was wrong. How stable is it? Super stable. <laughs>